Thank you for this kind introduction. And I want to also thank Sky and John for the MOSI program. I was part of the MOSI program and benefited it tremendously throughout the year through its support. So I'm great, very grateful for the chance to be here. So as David said, my paper today is part of a broader book project which explored the dramatic shift in Protestant and Catholic relations in Europe from animosity to friendship from the mid 19th century into the mid 20th century. Now, as historians are well aware, for centuries, European Christian religious, political, and especially intellectual life have been divided deeply along the denominational lines. And well into the 20th century, it was common for Catholic and Protestant writers to denounce each other intensely. One of the most profound political and intellectual forces is anti-Catholicism and anti-Protestantism. But in the middle of the 20th century, a radical revolution and swift revolution took place. Catholics and Protestants across the continent began making peace with each other. They founded common social organization, later political parties, in a process that became known as ecumenism. And this rapprochement reached its formal climax in the 1960s when the, Vatican, when the Catholic Church in Vatican II and the Protestant World Council of Churches both declared themselves to be brethren in faith in what amounts to the end of the religious wars. Now, despite the monumental scope and the importance of the ecumenism, there hasn't been much um, sustained scholarship that explores its causes in the same way that there is scholarship on anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. And the few scholars who have reflected on the process of ecumenism largely agreed on two premises. First, they described ecumenism, the peace between Catholic and Protestants, as part of the process of liberalization of the churches, a prolonged struggle that ultimately opened the churches to more tolerance, especially toward other religions like Judaism. And second, they explored it as a product of religious dialogue, as a product, a process of development that uh, developing shared Catholic Protestant terminologies and theologies. What I want to um, do today is to add a new perspective to this story. And I want to do so by claiming that ecumenism had a more concrete and more ideological motor, and that is the rise of Nazism. Many of the earlier luminaries of Catholic Protestant dialogue and cooperation began the work in the early 1930s. And they did so largely not in opposition to Nazism, but either out of sympathy to it or in active support of it. In fact, many were came to ecumenism because they sympathized with the Third Reich's anti-liberalism and anti-Semitism. And they continue to lead similar ideas and similar concepts well after World War II, um, in, when ecumenism really caught on fire in the continent. The book is um, pan-European, but today I'm going to focus on the German case in particular, or this is the German chapter of this book. Now, highlighting this story of how ecumenism came about help us rethink Christian thought and politics in two ways, I think. First, it shows that the rise of religious pluralism in Europe was not always tied to growing tolerance or growing liberalization. In fact, ecumenism for many was supposed to do the exact reverse, to end toleration. And second, more broadly, the story, I think, helped us to think about the relationship between political ideology, secular political ideologies, and the formation of religious discourses. The most striking thing about Catholicism and Protestant thinking in the last two centuries is how entangled they've been in either political ideological projects, from nationalism to populism. And scholars, however, universally have been interested in the role of this entanglement in conflict, in how religious discourse helped to shape political combat or animosities, xenophobia, for example. But it is also crucial that this entanglement turn out to be the precondition for sharp decline in religious animosities. And it, ultimately, it was exactly because Christian thinkers conflated political dogma with, ideolo with um, theological dogma that they ultimately came to identify other religious groups very similar to themselves and facilitated theological peace. So let me begin by saying a few words about the background to this story. During the 19th century and the early 20th century, interconfessional conflicts reflared all across Europe. From Germany to Holland to Hungary, European witnessed a renewal of Catholic Protestant conflicts in which each community sought to repress the other. In Germany, the most famous case is, of course, the Kulturkampf, the campaign against Catholics. Similar conflicts erupted elsewhere and also in Catholic majority countries like Spain. Protestants were not allowed to practice um, their religion openly. Some scholars call it the second confessional age. 
But unlike in pre previous confessional um, conflicts, the core issue was not dogmatic. Rather, it was ideological. Both Protestant and Catholic thinkers conceived themselves and the others part of a conceptual struggle over things that were not dogmatic, whether it's capitalism, nationalism, or others. The most important probably for the early 20th century is the conflict and the relationship between dogma and the Enlightenment. Protestant thinkers, for example, often conflated Protestantism with a notion of universal progress. For example, in 1912, the German theologian Ernst Rölsch published Protestantism and Progress, in which he claimed that the Protestant Reformation ultimately opened the door for rational and critical thinking, and he argued that this provided the preconditions for scientific work, for technological advancement, and for modern economics. Catholics, in return, often envision Catholicism as the bastion of tradition and authority, even if those obviously had to occasionally be modified. The French Catholic writer Léon Daudet, for example, famously insisted that Catholicism was the only community to resist the social disintegration of the modern spirit, which he bega argued began with Luther and then continued into the French Revolution, secularism, and, and then socialism, a lineage that was very common for Catholic writers at the time. And these ideological entanglements were the reason that confessional animosity continued well into the 1920s. The German Catholic theologian Karl Adam, for example, in his booklet from 1928, The Western Mind, explained why Luther, by undermining church's authority, ultimately opened the door for nihilism. And the Dutch Lutheran Gerhard Ollenmüller explained that Catholicism, because of its submission to papal authority and the worship of the saints, ultimately was the agent of slavery and anti-enlightenment, which led him to find the International League for Defense of Protestantism, which was organizing laymen against Catholicism. Things, however, changed drastically in the 1930s, and the key motor for this was the rise of Nazism. One of the most important uh, components of Nazi ideology was its promise to end the denominational divide in Germany. In its founding manifesto in 1919, famously, it expressed support for what it called positive Christianity, a new conception of religion that would include all non-Jews and non-communist Germans. And this was integral to its mission to forge a unified Aryan body. Hitler himself was quite occupied with this division, and he spent substantial time about it. There are long passages in Mein Kampf where he reflects about the nature of, of the denominational divide. Now, historians have long debated whether this rhetoric was genuine and whether it was cynical, to what extent there really was an affinity between Nazism or Christianity, and there's thousands of monographs on that. But whatever one judgment is, the Nazis went out of the way to market themselves as the first explicitly large-scale ecumenical movement in modern Europe. They promised to end the Christian division in the very country that led, uh, gave birth to the Reformation. Once the Nazis shot to the center of German politics in the 1930s, both Catholic and Protestant writers swiftly began to change their outlook that has been so entrenched since the 19th century. Under the influence of the Nazi ideological project, thinkers both began singing the praise of ecumenism and now began to claim that only interconfessional peace would realize the ideological meaning of Christianity. On the Catholic side, the most important figure in this effort was a theologian called Robert Gauche, who in 1932 launched the journal Catholica, which is the first Catholic journal dedicated for cooperation with Protestants, for ecumenism. And in it, he and many other writers explained that the community of believers did not correlate exactly to the borders of the visible church. Rather, it mattered, what really mattered was that what they called the mystical body of Christ, which included everyone who has been baptized, particularly Protestant. And I argued that ultimately it's because Jesus' body was um, sabotaged by being um, crucified that it lost its natural borders. And therefore, people who are not members of the Catholic Church still can be members of the mystical body of Christ. Similar ideas began to circulate in 1931 also in the Protestant side. There the leader was a Lutheran thinker, Wilhelm Stellin, later became the Bishop of Oldenburg, who also called for a new confessional peace. In a book called, in 1937 called The Mystery of God, he echoed Gauche's claim and he wrote, quote, if those who are separate from one another in the earthly historical realm may no longer esteem and love another as members in the body of Christ, then the battle for which Paul fought for has been fought in vain, end quote. And for Stalin, such recognition could receive a profound manifestation in liturgy and in theology. For example, he argued that there's no reason why Protestants shouldn't embrace a new calendar that uh, incorporated the Catholic celebration of the saints, 
celebration of the saints was one of the main uh, argument that Protestant argues against Catholics for being heretics. Stalin, in fact, also tried to put some institutional flesh on the skeleton of these ideas, and he helped found the Michael Bruderschaft, Michael uh, Brotherhood, an interconfessional order which trained later some of the most important figures of ecumenism. Now, such massive ideological undertaking could not have taken place also without substantial revisions for historical <coughs> narratives. And this task was shouldered by the historian Josef Lortz, probably the most important Catholic historian of his time. In the early 1930s, Lortz wrote a series of essays explaining the ideological affinity between Catholicism and Nazism, especially their joint opposition to Marxism. And at the exact same time, he also published a series of books on the history of the church, most importantly, a monumental two-volume work called The History of the Reformation of Ger in Germany, which has been translated to dozens of languages. In these works, Lotz for the first time abandoned the standard attack on Luther and claimed that Protestants were devout and well-meaning Christians. And he argued that their critique of the church and its corruption was justified, and if they tragically went so far, it was because the church itself was in a state of deep crisis. And well into the war, Lords continued to promote those ideas, for example, by publishing small guidelines about how to talk to your Protestant neighbors and so on. And after the war, he published the very first economical booklet in 1946, which would become the reference for the founding of the CDU, of the Christian Democratic Union, the first interconfessional party in German history. Interestingly, the English translation of Lotz to, um, of this work, omitted the chapter in which Lotz reflected on the relationship between Catholicism and Nazism, a chapter that was later omitted also in all the other German editions after the war. Now, to be sure and to be clear, not all ecumenists were Nazis or even fanatic Nazis. Some of them were well aware that there are some tensions between the regime and the churches. And they were well aware that several senior Nazis were proclaimed atheists, especially Alfred Rosenberg. But what they all shared with the regime was a profound opposition to liberalism and to the notion of religious tolerance and universal equality. The best example for this was the Catholic philosopher from Vienna, Hans Eibel, who in 1933 published the book The Meaning of the Present, which was one of the most enthusiastic calls for ecumenism. According to Eibel, the Third Reich presented a unique opportunity to reverse the separation of church and state. He argued that it would reestablish medieval unity between religion and politics, which would discard with the notion of religious equality. Only Christian would enjoy the privilege of legal, quotation, of legal uh, protection, arguing explicitly for the reversal of emancipation, which David Sorkin talked about. In 1935, he also traveled to London to participate in a conference of the International League of Fascists, where he proclaimed that the anti-liberal and anti-communist regime resurrected the Europe of the Middle Ages, and he argued that it would establish a Christian empire all across Eastern Europe. And through such action, Eibel claimed, Europe would finally get rid of what he called empty liberalism. And it was in this spirit that ecumenism spread all across Europe with the Nazis' military conquest. For example, in France, after 1940, Protestant and Catholic supporters of the uh, Vichy regime banded together to form the first pan-Christian academy in Uriage. And in Slovakia, the pro-Nazi government under Josef Tiso institutional mutual religious ceremonies in schools and military barracks. Now, there are also anti-Nazi ecumenists who begin to operate at this time. None of them receive the same level of support or reach the same level of intellectual production that the uh, pro-Nazi sympathizers ever received. And these initiate ties with Nazi ideologies meant that the early ecumenism did not entail necessarily any broader liberal opening for other religion. In fact, the exact opposite was the case. The case. Advocacy for interconfessionalism went hand in hand with intense intolerance, especially towards Jews. A good example for this is the German Catholic theologian, Otto Schilling, probably one of the most important Catholic theologians at the time and one of the most um, openly pro-Nazi ones. In 1936, Schilling published a rousing call for ecumenism entitled In Defense of Catholic Morality. And in it, he clarified that the church was very much in line with Nazi eugenic policies and racial policies, especially when it comes to discrimination against Jews. And he wrote the following, quote, the church does not underestimate the importance of blood, race, and soil, and their importance to the people's growth and health. health. It recognizes especially that the mixing of different races discriminates against the bearers of high culture, and, its sorts of and therefore it is a source of spiritual disruption, end quote. And similar sentiments were important also for Protestant author 
from Berlin and priest from Berlin, Hermann Zauer, who in 1938 published a popular ecumenical book called Western Decisions, in which he argued that Protestants had to join hands with Catholics in order to declare war on the enemies of the cross. He argued that that is first and foremost the Soviet Union, but also uh, Muslims in the Middle East that he argued Nazi Germany should ultimately go and um, conquer. So for ecumenists, inter-Christian peace was not about opening Christianity to others. In anything, it was about demarcating more clearly where the border with really stood and how important it was to bolster the border. So to conclude these brief remarks, so what are the consequences of this genealogy for our thinking about religion and ideology? There are two points that I think merit um, attention. The first is about the history of Christian thought, something that George Moshe himself has not written a lot in, about, and I think this is one of the main lacuna that um, intellectual history and um, cultural history of this period still very much operates with. The story allows us to have a more nuanced view of religious pluralism, at least in the way it has developed in mid-century uh, Europe. It reminds us that the, it, that the end of the wars of religion entailed not only ex expansion of inclusion or tolerance, but also and simultaneously very harsh exclusion. At least as far as continental ecumenists were concerned, the end of internal Christian conflict was needed because new wars, new wars were lurking behind the corner. The second point that I would like to make, and I think more broadly, is about religion in the age of modern secular ideologies. Scholars have long debated how exactly to map religions into the broader narrative of the age of ideologies. It is clear that the simple theories of secularization that assumed the continuous decline in religious commitments are not accurate for describing the 19th and 20th centuries. But it is also clear that the dogmatic differences did not continue to operate the same way that they did in the past. The story of ecumenism helps perhaps to chart a different way of thinking about this issue. It helps track how dogmatic issues became entangled in ideological projects, even if not identical to them, and often helped define them. It is the relationship between Protestants and Catholics was always part of a triangle that relates to other ideological projects. And in the long run, this ideological entanglement can also help us speculate why the broader decline in religious adherence, which began in the 1960s in Europe, happened. It is once the ideological project that enabled ecumenism that began to lose its appeal, that Christianity also began to lose much of its allure. Thank you.